um, one area. And here, what's your presentation? My name is Jamie Hendricks. I'm the Wellness Center Specialist over at North. And yeah, this feels really applicable with a lot that is going on with it. Yeah, I know there's a lot going on. Uh, Brody Dwyer, Peer Support Specialist with David Nelson. Andrea Fernandez, I'm the uh, multi specialist at Alex Media. Uh, so, yes, I'm the director of program services for the Poison Girls Club at I'm Heather Schweitz, I'm program manager for SOS Outreach for Project Hillary Gomez, I'm um, a call specialist at North Office. Chrissy Hennessy, I'm an analyst with Community Health. Bruno Brad, Club Law, and I'm a specialist in Community Health. <laughs> We take turns online too. How does that work? I am going to, yeah, I can announce them. Okay. Let's see if I can get this to stop presenting. It's not stopping. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's happening. It's not stopping. Okay, well, we're going to roll with that. Okay. Um, so um, we'll just look at you in the, the corner there. Devin, if you could start. Good morning, Devin Bradley, Nevada County Public Health. Thanks for joining us, Jonathan. Great. Um, can you go, Emily? Good morning, everyone. My name is Emily Ramey. I'm the wellness specialist uh, for TTUSD. I work with Kim. Um, my son is six, so I'm home today. And thank you all so much for being here. And thank you to Jonathan. Really, really looking forward to this today. Great. Thank you. Ciela. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ciela. I'm the Prevention Program Manager at Sierra Community House. Great. Dom. Hi, I'm Ciela's colleague, Dom Apollon. I'm the Community Education and Prevention Coordinator at Sierra Community House. Kathy. Hi. Kathy Perkins. I'm School Counselor in TTUSD. River. River Coyote Health Educator, Placer County Public Health in Carnelian Bay. Uh, Haley. No. Um, Chelsea. Good morning, Chelsea Roth, um, Tahoe Forest Hospital Behavioral Health, Pediatric Behavioral Health Intensivist, and I work with you, Jonathan, and you're awesome. <laughs> Kathleen. Uh, Megan. Hi, I'm Megan Hurley, school counselor at Alder Creek Middle School. And is there anyone else I didn't name if you want to hop on and introduce yourself? Okay, welcome. We're glad you can join virtually and for those in the room. We're going to make this work. <laughs> okay. Hey. Awesome. This should work now, right? I think so. Yeah, it's still presenting. Okay. The, the topic is a little bit misleading, understanding teen substance use, but we're not going to walk out of here understanding teen substance use. So if that's your, uh, I know that, that it looks like that's the goal. Uh, we will talk about some tools to support the recovery. One of the reasons it's hard to understand teen substance use um, is hard because we are not as medical professionals going to do good scientific studies and grab a bunch of kids and say, we might be giving you drugs, but you're not going to know. And another group of kids with a placebo, right? And, and you know, separate out those groups and just see how they track. So a lot of this data is caught on the back end of things as we become adults, right? Um, and I also want to be clear that the things I'm going to be sharing today, the statistics, again, it's based off of the best that we can do with research, uh, as well as the maybe suggestions on how best to support teens which really depends on the culture, the community, um, you know, the access. Uh, and, and again, we'll get into all of that in more depth. All right, icebreaker. It's one of my favorite icebreaker um, questions, right? Uh, what was your, um, like your, like your parents didn't take you? You decided, like, this is the band I want to see. This is the concert I want to go to. I want to know who it was. And then give us a little, you know, little tidbit. It's supposed to be too young, right? So for me, 1993 Lawler events, you know, <laughs> Guns N' Roses, right? uh, with, with Megadeth canceled because of the weather, and so we went to see Guns N' Roses, and myself and Gerber, so let's see, I was 13 at the time, or just 12, almost 13, 
And I, we paid a guy in front of us four dollars. This is the tea to buy one loose cigarette. And we shared it between the four of us. <laughs> also relevant for the topic today in terms of exposure. Uh, and that was my first concert. I Mine was Elton John, but I lost. <laughs> I was I was in college, so I was a little bit older. Um, and my dad and I went to I think Arco Arena in Sacramento, and uh, um, I went and saw Dirk Bentley, who's a country singer, and I got my friend got us backstage passes because she knew the store manager and got to meet him <laughs> and watch the show from the stage. So it was really exciting. <laughs> uh, high school, circa 2004, senior year ish, big and rich. Mm -hmm. While we were in Reno. Friends and I, you know, we were the ones to lift the trucks on campus kind of day. So <laughs> it just fit, you know, probably still one of the best concerts I've ever been. I was 16 or 17, and I went to see more in Europe since I'm Mexican, all the from the city. So that meant it was really fun. I liked my parents, but I was staying at a friend's name. The first album I ever bought was Origin of Symmetry by Muse. Mm -hmm. and I was super into Muse, I thought it was cool. Um, just, <laughs> um, but uh, I think the, um, I've seen them live in both atmospheres. So I've seen them live in the UK and then I've seen them live in the UK. Nice. My first concert, I was like 14 or 15 and <laughs> Alright, so something went down, Dave Matthews. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's it all. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, I was in middle school. Michelle Branch opened for Carol Crow at the Hilton, which knows who we are, like in the parking lot. <laughs> it was just like a tween girl fest, so a lot of team world shenanigans. <laughs> okay, without my parents or another friend's parents in Bollywood, so the festival at RFK, Griffin Down, such that I don't know to see these two at the place. So it was like dozens of bands. I remember back a lot of mosh pits. So that was where I saw them. Yeah. <laughs> so I married one there. I was like an action. My world is a deal. I'm from Brazil. I was a rock band called Titans. And it wasn't MTV was they were broadcasting a lot of them throughout the concerts and then we had them like Brazilian ones there. And it's funny you mentioned that it was you shared a cigarette with your friends. It was the first time I tried a cigarette and I hate it. Mm. My father is a doctor and the next morning I coughed and he was like, Oh my gosh, that sounds like a smoke like how <laughs> somebody else has been smoking. <laughs> Um, it, uh, my parents were there. We just happened upon the Bill Graham Memorial Concert in Golden Gate Park. I was in fifth grade. That's like, quite the first concert. That's I awesome. know, and it was so amazing. It's like Santana and Grateful Dead and probably some Nash Band. And you just like happened upon this? Just like walking? Like, oh, there's this uh, giant It's concert. what I would have chosen as a kid, but it also was my first exposure. Hot. Ah, <laughs> like, all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll go. I went to Gloria Estefan and the Miami Sound Machine at the Circus Star in Redwood City when I was in seventh grade. And it was a rotating stage. Oh, and my friends and I were like, um, and then we have some people online. Um, River said Depeche Mode at NXS. I think it was in San Francisco around 1985 or 86. I think I might have been there, River. New Kids on the Block, baby. Joey was my favorite. So cute. That's Chelsea. Um, Dom, my first concert during my freshman year of college, 1992, was either Public Enemy or Indigo Girls in Charlottesville, Virginia. Can't remember which one was first. Very opposite end of the That's what River said. Dom, what a great range of music yeah. there. <laughs> Devin, the Beach Boys at Circle Star, sixth grade. That's right, Devin, Circle Star. Um, Viviana, Mr. Bungle in San Francisco. Anyone else that didn't get to type it in want to hop on? Oh, Emily, my aunt took me to see Bruce Springsteen, who I don't even like, and I mentioned 
to her while we were there that I could smell cigars. And my aunt said, Emily, that's weed. And that's how I found out my dad smokes pot. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> 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 that's appropriate for this topic. Um, <laughs> Dom said, I think I was the only person in town who was at both of the shows. Remember, I was in heaven. Uh, Kathy saw Grateful Dead at Boreal. Wow. Okay, thank you all for sharing. Um, are we back on to this will work now? Uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> all right, so. This is kind of what I expected to see coming out here. I, I like to use these like cheesy memes because it makes my son and daughter just go like, uh. And I'm in that stage of parenthood where I live to just embarrass them. I get so much joy, like a pathological amount of joy out of just embarrassing my children at this stage in my life. Um, so yeah, this is what we expected to see. This is what we're all seeing. I don't think I've talked to one adult here where I, you know, the, hey, this is an issue and happens to other movie. Um, seems like everybody knows about this, but one of the things I think that we're all kind of looking for maybe next steps is like, what are we going to do about it? Like, it's not a secret anymore. Um, we're, you know, per capita, like we shouldn't be losing the amount of people that we're losing. Um, the amount of kids that I've, that I've seen <sighs> impacted by this. Um, you know, the amount of teenagers that I've seen lose their lives to this, even in just the Truckee area since I moved here, it's more than I thought and definitely more than we should be seeing based on national statistics that we've got a big problem. Um, when we first moved here, we were introducing ourselves as best as we could because it was March of 2020, so everything just shut down, right? And some of the parents said, well, you know, if, if your son, he was in middle school at the time, you know, wants to, uh, you know, our kids, they go down to Prosser, um, and that's what the, what the kids do on the weekend. So this is a parent, you know, saying, but what goes on in Prosser? It's like, oh, they go down there and they party, and sometimes, you know, there's beer, and, and then it's just kind of what they do, and I can hook them up with the, you know, the right people that can take them to and from, and my wife and I were just like, wow, no, <laughs> absolutely not. Um, but it was really normal, like it was a normal conversation. Um, and it's, again, similar, I think, to what my wife and I experienced growing up in South Tahoe in terms of what are the kids doing uh, when the lights, you know, when the, when the sun goes down. And I'm hoping that this can be one of many conversations that happen uh, where we can start to figure out, okay, okay, so how do we get things on the ground? What are we doing about it? How can we do more? Um, these, these, these are... These are preventable losses that we're seeing, right? Uh, and I think, again, I think this is based on what I'm hearing from this crowd, you guys know all of this already. So this is a, like one, of the, one of the simpler uh, schematics I found for addiction, um, you know, back a, a long time ago. And I'm like, that's not going to work for my smart recovery groups when I'm talking to teens or, um, uh, or middle schoolers, like they're not gonna, like we're not even gonna get this deep and this is just scratching the surface. So uh, when I think about addiction, this is how I explain it. Um, I draw it out on the board, you've probably seen this in some of my smart recovery <laughs> meetings, um, involving some key areas, the prefrontal cortex, and that's where we all live, that's where we as humans exist, conscious thought exists, self-identity, it's the chess player of the brain. It's the part of our brain that also helps us with things like empathy and understanding what other people are going through. And those will become important here in just a second. The prefrontal cortex is a very light connection to the nucleus accumbens. And then we have this ventral tegmental area. This has a really, really strong, and this is kind of an, an unconscious part of the brain. This is not under our uh, control and, and has, uh, we have little influence over it. We have some. And I would argue we have more influence, even though it's light over the nucleus accumbens, where the ETA has a lot, a lot of influence over the nucleus accumbens. That connects to the amygdala that regulates the release of dopamine. And most of, most of the time I put this on the board, the kids know that. Like, oh, like, I know dopamine. I've heard that before, right? Uh, maybe these other areas I haven't. And then I explain that what we're doing in recovery is we are trying to put a person like me up against a person like Conor McGregor, right? The VTA is extremely strong, right? 
um, when, when we light the invisible fuse of addictive disorders, and by that I mean addiction is one of many chronic organ illnesses that exist throughout the body that is a disease of choice, meaning we do not choose to have this disease, but our choice making is a direct decider on whether or not we will develop symptoms of that disease. For instance, in my family, we have the disease of addiction, right? But if I don't pick up heroin, the chances of me becoming addicted to heroin are very, very low. Right? Even though I know that this invisible fuse exists in my brain where it might not exist in your brain. And so I talked to the kids about how important, first off, DNA is in terms of whether or not you have a Conor McGregor, right? If and when that fuse gets lit, really strong connection to the nucleus accumbens, and then in places like smart recovery um, and in treatment centers, right, what we're doing, uh, therapy, right, we're trying to strengthen the uh, adolescent's prefrontal cortex. And that takes a very, very long time, as we'll find out. Um, and it's a, it's a hard, hard battle. However, if you train me, right, if, if, you, if you give me months of training on how to pop and weave, like maybe I can survive like 10 seconds with a Conor McGregor. And that 10 seconds could mean the difference between me picking up and using again, or just like running out of the room. Okay. Um, so this is the, like, uh, over the 20 years, this is the simplest I've been able to kind of break down what's happening in the brain and being really specific, right? I don't take a stance that we are powerless against our addictions, and I don't take a stance that we have complete control over our addictions. I don't believe either one of those things. I believe in addiction as a chronic illness, which means we can have influence over it, right? Because I don't want any of my patients or these kids to feel like they're powerless. Like, I have this thing and now I'm just a victim and there's nothing I can do about it. I want to give them a sense of power. Um, but I also want to be realistic in how much power that we have and what that power looks like. We do not control any of the organs in our body. You know, when we tell a child or a teenager, like, control yourself, get, get your emotions under control, get yourself under control, that's impossible. Right? All these things are just happening in the brain. As we become aware of what's going on, we can then strengthen our prefrontal cortex to counteract these extremely, extremely strong elements in the brain. And that is especially true when it comes to, uh, you know, substance use. So I'm not going to read everything off, uh, because that's boring. But these slides, I'm sure we'll, we could send these out too. Is that right, Kim? Yeah. Right, so uh, you know, I put together just some basics for us in terms of you know, access to drugs. Like, what are some of the drugs that we have easier access for? There's no such thing as a gateway drug. The gateway drug is just what you get your hands on first. For me, it was that cigarette at the Guns N' Roses concert in 1993, because I had access. Um, and then shortly after that, it was alcohol. And yeah, cannabis was always around. If we think about what our kids and teens have access to, um, it always fluctuates, and it usually largely depends on what the adults are using, because that trickles down to our kids. So what we've seen more recently, and this ebbs and flows, right, is the rise of cocaine. I'm also seeing the rise of uh, psilocybin um, psychedelic mushrooms because there's more and more adults growing these in their homes and so these teenagers are like oh no so and so's dad like has a whole room where we can just pick these out right um, access of substances i was uh, uh, talking earlier about my daughter walking the wild cherries from uh, her six now she's in sixth grade cells so you just watch wild cherries and the other day she comes home with a can of uh, uh, air duster you know the, the spray that you use on your computer keyboard. She's like, I just found this lying on the ground. Isn't that weird? I was like, no, that's not. <laughs> uh, so when we think about access and when we think about uh, what um, what teens are more likely to use, inhalants is actually a big one of them, and I don't think people quite understand that. Whether it's nitrous, like through whippets, or air duster. I think a lot of adults have these things lying around their home, and they're not even aware of how dangerous that is potentially for their preteen, their teenager in the home. So all, you know, all cannabis is interesting because it's one of these few drugs where some of the research has shown that chronic use, especially starting in adolescence, can lower your IQ and uh, it doesn't necessarily bounce back after you get sober. 
right? So your brain doesn't really heal. So there's always that trope growing up of that, you know, kind of stone, stupid hippie, right? Like, oh, like that didn't seem to know what's going on. And that trope, I think, exists now. We have some research behind that of why and what happened to that person's brain along the way that made them kind of present so dull, right? Um, and I think that, that I always find that interesting about the tendencies. Another important part that I want to talk about with the teenage brain is, uh, you know, how it develops and the importance of pruning, right? So pruning is something that all of our brains are supposed to do, and they all do, right, in, in adolescence. We kind of get rid of um, focus areas, right, of neurons and connections that we had made up until that point. We're like, okay, we don't really need this anymore. We need to make space for new things to come in. And so we see this pruning of uh, uh, naturally occurring, this kind of like clipping of neurons. And what happens is that in the adolescent brain, we actually take a step backwards. It's the one time in development this happens. The prefrontal cortex loses matter, loses gray matter. And remember, that's the part of our brain that is supposed to be our chess player, right? Like if I do this, the you know, two moves away, this is going to be the outcome. It's the part of the brain with empathy. So suddenly, you know, some of us working with these teens are like, oh, I knew that they were such smart, sweet kids, and now they're just mean and kind of dumb. Right? <laughs> like they're making choices. I'm like, well, who are you? And like, why is this happening? Well, it's happening because this is exactly what's supposed to be happening in our adolescent development. Uh, our brains are designed to do this. Meanwhile, our our brains are taking this huge step back with the prefrontal cortex and all these, you know, things that should and will come back hopefully. Right, in their usually early, mid-20s, the amygdala is as powerful as it will ever get. And this is our pleasure risk-taker uh, seeking um, you know, part of our brain. And then to complicate things further, there's emerging research and newer research now that shows that there is this extremely, extremely important connection between the prefrontal cortex um, and uh, the cingulate cortex right here, and that connection is responsible for us making rational, reasonable decisions, right? So, uh, so that's why the cartoons there, right? Is that like when I'm trying to help teens understand the dangers of substance use, I, I, I literally am I'm speaking to an alien, right? Then we speak two different languages because they cannot, right? They cannot understand it to the depth and uh, that that I do, and that's. We need, to, we need to recognize that. Because a lot of the interventions we've had for teens up to this point have just been these scare tactics. I remember being in high school and before every prom, they would, you know, the firefighters would come in and like see this wrecked car. Here's the jaws of life. This was a drunk driver. And we're all just kind of bored standing around, you know, maybe feeling a little something. That night, what were we all doing? Driving drunk. We're idiots. I was an idiot. Right? Um, the we're kind of built to be, to be dumb. <laughs> and so how we approach teens and their substance use and how we try to engage with them is really important because we know things like just say no, right? Scare tactics. They aren't very effective and have not historically been very effective for teens. So this is a good example of what happens in the brain. I used to love this thing, right? We had this carnival that would come around Round Hill in uh, South Lake Tahoe once a year. And this was like my favorite thing. And I would try and get the thing to spin as fast as possible, right? Um, and then somewhere along the way, probably in my 30s, because I'm a little bit slower than most in terms of development, I went to a carnival with my ch uh, children, or my son at the time, and I had a completely different reaction. Like I saw who, I was like, I can see the people who were responsible for building this. Like, there's like maybe three teeth in between two of them, right? Um, uh, this thing is extremely, extremely, I was having all these fears and thoughts about this ride that I'd never even considered before, would never even think. I literally was on the top of a roller coaster and in my head popped this thought of like, did I, you know, have we finished up our, you know, uh, will? Like, do we have that set? Like thoughts I would never have thought. And that's because, again, there's these parts of my brain that are, were now connected that weren't when I was a kid. Um, I was better able to understand risk, um, better able to see danger. I was less apt to just only purely be seeking out dopamine and thrills. And sometimes in my smart recovery meeting, we'll talk about, like, well, why, why is the brain built this way? Why would 
evolution do this to us? And you know, I tell uh, the, the, the teens in the room, well, because for a very, very long time, uh, <laughs> the majority of human existence, you guys were seniors, like senior citizens. You don't have much longer to be on this planet. And so our brain stopped thinking about consequences, right? And just sought pleasure. And how are we getting pleasure? And then there's this silence, and usually one nervous hand raises up and is like, sex? It's like, yes! <laughs> <laughs> Your brain wanted you to procreate. The problem is now is that we found all of these ways to release unnatural levels of dopamine just sitting in a chair, like way beyond sex, and we'll kind of go over that uh, a little bit later. Um, we're not going to play this down because we found out this is feedback problem. But I, uh, this, this is just a fun little exercise I like to do uh, with adults and teens to talk about, again, the, the power when we discuss um, the unconscious mind, the power it has over us, is that uh, we're just going to try a little experiment. We're all going to close our eyes, including myself. I want you to imagine, because I think we're all old enough here, fingernails slowly scraping a cross of blackboard. Or if you have metal fillings, I want you to imagine chewing on tinfoil. Just sit with those sounds in your head, you know, those experiences in your head for just a second. Okay, so some of you, like myself, may have experienced just these little tingling feelings on your scalp and skin, right? And despite you know, the memory of, of nails across a chalkboard, or the memory of chewing on tinfoil, if you have feelings like I do. Um, <laughs> what's happening is that this memory is causing my favorite muscle in the body called the erector pili muscle. And there's these little tiny fibrous muscles that are attached to each one of your hairs. And when these muscles contract, they cause your hairs to stand up on end, and they cause like goosebumps, right? And then there's tens of thousands of these things, right? And so, the, the, the idea is that that experience is meant to shift blood flow to our core, because it's a, it's, a, it's a reaction, it's a fight or flight reaction. And the idea is, is those sounds, like the sound of fingernails across a, a blackboard, are at the same frequency as a baby crying, or as a shrill scream of an animal in the wild. So it was kind of this like, okay, get blood to the core, get to the baby, or run from the animal screech, right? <laughs> and the reason why I love this exercise so much is because we're talking about a very, this isn't a traumatic memory for me, you know, fingernails across a chalkboard. This isn't a drug craving, right? This is something pretty benign. And yet I was able to, just by thinking about it, cause tens of thousands of muscles to all contract at once. That's huge. And so now if we take that same concept and, you know, put it over into a teen experience a craving for nicotine or a drug, or a team with trauma and how they might carry that in their body and how that affects their use. It, it, it's an easy way for me to display to teenagers of that, of that power and how little control we have over these processes. Right? This is, if, if you take anything away from today, this is the theme, is that addiction is a biopsychosocial illness, right? Long time, right? We've been focusing on biological, psychological, and social elements of addiction, affecting some sort of brain switch, right? Again, like those little invisible fuses that we all have that we can thank our great ancestors for that lead to addiction. There's one element, though, that we've been recently adding and focus on that I think is really important, and that's use, right? There, there has to be a trigger to this. It's not enough for me to have, again, like I said, that I have the biology for heroin addiction in my family. I have to have access and then use heroin in order to make that process like work, right? Um, access to alcohol. And so again, we, this is important because we need to think about what do our local teens, regardless of what the national studies tell us, what do our local teens have access to? And, and like we talked about, things that are going to be on the rise, I think, and, and that we really don't have good data on are things like psychedelics. Um, and then things that have constantly been a problem in Truckee, South Lake Tahoe, North Lake Tahoe, cocaine, right? Alcohol, cannabis seem to be the big ones. Biological factors. This includes genetics and our neurobiology. Again, I'm not going to take time to read all this off. I know you guys can read all of these. 
psychological factors, our mental health. This is the biggest one. This is where teens are really susceptible. I would, you couldn't pay me enough to go through middle school again. Like I don't care the amount of money. I would never do that again. It was such intense feelings. I hated it. Right? It's a cruel thing that we do to children. I think we should probably just like put them in cryo sleep and then just like, oh, you're 22 now. You can come out. Uh, so these these. And so if we begin using, like, think about it, you know, teen use it doesn't happen in a vacuum. Like, I didn't go out and just, like, decide, you know, I'm going to go score today. We'll see what that's like on my own, right? That doesn't happen. It's a, it's a, it, it takes access and it takes usually friend groups that we'll talk about in the social piece. And then imagine you're a teenager or a tween, right? And you're all anxious because that's who you are. And you're wondering, does that person like me? Or I'm in love with this person. And then somebody's like, hey, smoke this. And you're like, and all your anxiety just poof, disappears. Drink this. And I'm like, oh, now I feel like I can just hang out and be funny and, and do things. Like, that's an amazing power. And I think that we also have to remember that. So when we talk about substances in my substance use group, we recognize we don't just talk about them as bad things, right? The vast majority of the people in recovery that I've treated, drugs and alcohol saved their life, or they felt that it saved their life at one time, right? Got them through trauma, got them through really serious social anxiety, helped them to feel normal, and then the continued use is killing them, or, you know, is almost killing them. And so it's tricky, right? Especially when you're a middle school teenager, and, and who wouldn't? I mean, I think it, it's, it makes sense. Like, if somebody could say, hey, little Jonathan, are you feeling anxious? Just do this, and that just goes away magically. And it actually feels good, and music sounds really cool, and like all this other stuff is happening. That's really enticing. And that's kind of, again, what we're up against. And I think recognizing that is an important part of talking to teens and helping them uh, understand the importance of recovery from that platform. Certain personality traits, cognitive factors. So cognitive factors beliefs and thought patterns, the beliefs here in Truckee that these things aren't a big deal, the amount of parents that smoke cannabis with their children is alarming. Right? The amount of parents, again, like going back to when I first came here, that are seem just fine with these kids going out into the woods, and that's what they do at Prosser. And for me, it's like, what do you think is happening there? You send a bunch of kids with drugs and alcohol out to the, the dark woods, and there's going to be sexual assaults, there's going to be truck drivers, there's going to be addictions. The easiest way I explain to my teens is the 2 out of 10 rule. So if I just take all the research and put it in a big bucket, I say it's the 2 out of 10 rule. I send you and nine of your friends out into the woods to, and again, it doesn't matter, smoke a cigarette, smoke pot, drink, right? whatever it is. Eight of you are going to walk out of that just fine. Pick it up, put it down, maybe we'll go back next week and maybe you won't. Two of you are going to have a profound experience that, that could cost you your life. And you won't know that who you are, right? You don't know that those, that invisible fuse is there. There are ways to know that. We'll talk about that later, too, right? Um, but that's, and it's just, it's just all of this. It's just medical odds, like in any other area of medicine. It's just an odds. And, and so I think it's also important for teens to know that it's not that there's something wrong with them. Right? That they can't hold their liquor or they're not, you know, they just need to kind of build up a bigger tolerance to the drugs like their, their friends seem to have. It is their, the whim, we are all at the whim of our DNA. I think we don't appreciate enough how much that has just dictated our whole lives. And usually when I talk about the 2 out of 10 rule to help them understand what's happening in their brain versus what's not happening in their friend's brain is the gun argument. And the gun argument is something that used to be used to prove that addictions were a moral problem, right? The gun argument was this, is that you two come to my bar, you have a, an alcohol use disorder, you do not. And I set down two shots of this and say, go ahead and drink those, but if you do, now, both of you are probably going to be on that bags. If we had a, and so for a long time, that argument right there was like, see, they just gotta, they just gotta do the right thing. Right? They just gotta make better choices. The problem is, is that, uh, that we didn't have at that time functional MRIs, which we now do. So if I hooked you both up to a functional MRI, 
and it did that same experiment. Got some sleep. Would we'll blow your brains out. Your brain would be like, oh, like maybe you have some anxiety reaction, you point a gun on you. Um, <laughs> that's all you would see. You would experience what's called a pre high. There would be this process happening in your brain that's not happening in your brain. By just seeing that glass, your brain would start to release dopamine through that ventral, tegmental pathway I was showing you earlier. Right? I'd see this all the time in my recovery program um, where even just calling my, my, uh, some of my patients, if they got a hold of, the, of a cell phone, calling their dealer, like their symptoms of physical withdrawal would just calm because their brain was getting this little pre hire this release of dopamine. Jonathan, would yeah. you mind just saying a little bit louder the example with if you had a gun and shot oh. whiskey? The people online couldn't hear that as well and wanted to catch that. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. So, uh, again, this argument was uh, uh, used for a long time to uh, try and prove that addictive disorders were moral problems. It was a problem of choice. You just had to choose to be a better person. With functional MRIs, I could now uh, hook these two brains up at the same time. This one with an alcohol use disorder, this one without. Put down shots of whiskey, pull a gun on both of them, say, I'm going to blow your brains out if you drink that, uh, that shot of whiskey. This person would have no reaction in terms of that ventral tegmental area that I was showing you earlier. And whereas this person would experience this light up and this release of dopamine that is the part of the, the disease pathway of addictive brains. And most likely, if we were then to do like a family lineage with this person, we would find out like, oh, my father was an alcoholic, or my mother was, or my uncle was. There would be something in the family pathway that gave this person that fuse that may not exist in this person's brain. I hope that came through. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Social factors, family environment, we kind of touched on this, right? Um, and we'll talk about, you know, this is a really interesting and I would argue maybe one of the easiest ways to target and help uh, prevent teen substance use. Um, peer influence, of course, this is huge, right? Like I said, I didn't go out and cop any of the drugs I've ever used on my own until I was probably in my 20s, right? But as a teen, it's a very social, social thing. Um, and it requires kind of like somebody's older brother, like it all gets passed down, right? And that's why it usually starts off um, uh, in middle school and we need to be careful with things like bus composition, right? Or composition of separating out kids. In, in my small town, um, South Lake Tahoe, we were on the Nevada side, very small school called Patel. And eventually it got so small that they had to absorb, I think, six, uh, six graders into the high school, six, seven, and eight. Uh, but I know when I left there, at least eight. Dude, do not put eighth graders with juniors and seniors. Like it's so dangerous. Like they're operating at such different levels in terms of exposure. And again, the age of exposure is really important, and we will go over that. Um, socioeconomic factors, economic status. So again, this this resources, right? I mean, right now we're seeing an uptick in cocaine use. We are clearly a uh, community with resources, right? Um, Cocaine's not a drug you just kind of like fall into, and it's not cheap. <laughs> it's also not real cocaine anymore either, I would argue. <laughs> um, so reward pathways, going back to the uh, neurological underpinnings and what's happening. So when we look at natural rewards versus non-natural rewards, right? So in turn, this is the percentage of dopamine released in the basal ganglia. Right? So food will cause you to kind of peak out around 200. Sex is a little bit higher than food. Morphine, um, and that's based off of weight, I believe uh, 10 milligrams per kilogram. Uh, cocaine, nicotine, alcohol, man, look at amphetamines. Look at what that can do. And like, I think that, that kind of speaks volumes to exposure to things like methamphetamine. Right? Um, So most adolescents who use substances do not meet criteria for substance use disorders. And that's a tough one. Like the DSM, the diagnostic manuals that we use in medicine are catching a lot of these kids that are high, high risk. Uh, so typically what we see is we have, you know, we have screeners that might not show up hot if the kids answer honestly, which I would argue many of them don't. And then, it were, and then we're completely reliant on this child who we already clearly decided can't make rational decisions <laughs> or healthy decisions 
for at least like the next eight years to tell on themselves and recognize that there's a problem in the first place. Okay. Uh, so the, they'll go to their primary care provider and uh, primary care provider with my wife in the room asks my son, are you using any drugs? Yeah, 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 I am. Yeah, yeah, cool, cool. Way to bring that up right now, right? And then the primary care providers kind of just, you know, hope that their relationship and connection to that kid that they might see just once a year for a physical is enough to get that information out. Uh, and we know it's not. Okay. There are ways to get that information that we'll talk about, too. 90% uh, of adults with substance use disorders started using substances in adolescence. Earlier use, and we'll go to those numbers in a second, correspond with higher rates of lifetime substance use disorders. And then the lack of coping strategies. Okay, we were, oh, man, again, I really hate middle school, and I was like, it's such a tough time, <laughs> right? All of these emotions, why, why? Why would you do this? Like, why would the world and the universe do this to us? Give us all these emotions, but before we could have built up the coping strategies. Like my daughter, she's she's 12. She could give birth right now. Like she's her body is allowing her to do that, and she has no coping strategies if she can't find her socks right in the morning to get ready for school. Like it's so screwed up uh, the way things go. But that's that's what happens um, during abstinence. Uh, and so I don't want to be all bad news, right? Because that's a bummer. Uh, during abstinence, specifically with adolescents, they develop and they get back to health faster than my adult patients because of the neurogenesis and the neuroplasticity. So really it's just whatever we can do to kind of get them and keep them sober. Um, and this is not going to come as a sur surprise, right? As we would expect developmentally, uh, the peers are huge. Right? And again, we'll talk about strategies as we get like, okay, so what do we do about that? What do we do about the peers? What do I do about my son or daughter's friends? Um, adolescents who complete long-term treatment. So this is typically treatment that's six months or greater. Uh, are likely to achieve successful outcomes. But again, these studies are tough, and the outcomes aren't fantastic. Uh, I will tell you that. Absence during the first year is associated with reduced substance abuse for the three-year mark. So again, looking at this through the lens of any area of medicine, if I had you come into my office and I said, you know, I'm, I'm diagnosing you with this problem with your pancreas, and we can take this treatment and I can give you a 17% chance that you're going to be fine in a year, or this treatment, which is a, a, a little bit more involved, and there's, you know, an 80% chance that you're going to be fine in a year. Most of us would look at these types of health conditions and health problems and say, like, okay, yeah, let's, let's get that going. And, and, and again, I try and think about substance use disorders through the same lens, because it's, it's all organs, it's all odds. So what can 90 days, it's, a lot of people are used with like the, to the 30-day model, 90-day model of treatment, and they don't necessarily know where that comes from, <laughs> which I always thought was, it was fascinating. Um, so the 30-day treatment model is actually thought to come from the United States Air Force in the 1970s. And here's why. So the Air Force, maybe to no surprise, had a few alcoholics. <laughs> and, um, you know, they didn't, they wanted to kind of like, okay, well, we're going to take care of our service members here with our own staff, our own clinicians. And if I don't pull you off your station on this base for more than, I don't have to replace you. So the advent of 30-day treatment, we can fix this very complicated chronic organ illness in 30 days. Right? And, so, and it permeated into everything, including medicine, including what insurance will pay for, right? And you know, how they pay for treatment, even though if I send you for 90 days of treatment or less, you have the same odds. If, if the goal is absence in a year, right? You will have the same odds that if you just came to my facility for one or two days. That's insane. But we're still doing this. You still see this all the time. 30-day program. 60-day programs, 90-day programs, it doesn't mean anything. But other areas of time we've seen be really, really positive in terms of correlation. The six-month mark being the start. If I can achieve six months of abstinence, that's a, that's a, uh, if I can achieve six, six months of abstinence, the chances that I am going to be abstinent late, uh, at a year mark now hits that 90 percentile, below 90s. So again, I could give you this treatment and give you like probably a 6% chance, 
for this treatment, and like a 90% chance, hopefully all of us would be like, oh, in any area of medicine, we would say, like, what do I need to do to get back, right? One year is important because we know that leads to three. Five years is really important. If someone is in recovery and absence for five years, the odds of them developing a substance use disorder in the future now goes back to gen pop levels. Right? So this doesn't mean that that person can go pick up and use again, right? Because they still have that invisible fuse that they now very much know about. But the odds or the percentage of those patients that will relapse and, and develop a, sub, a diagnosable substance use disorder again goes back to just any Joe Schmo you pick up of the population. So time is crucial. And that, again, speaks to what's happening in the brain in terms of healing, development, understanding the prefrontal cortex, right? building that up. Adolescents are tough, though. Right? Uh, they're less likely than my adult patients to remain absent after just a period of some sort of treatment. I expect, and I tell the, the teams that I work with, I expect relapse. That's a part of the process. We expect that actually with any chronic illness. In fact, it's a defining characteristic of chronic illness. So when Mr. Lowe comes back to the emergency room because his blood sugar is through the roof again, and like, Mr. Lowe, what happened? Well, I stopped using my insulin and I ate a chocolate cake last night. We, what we don't do is, you know, shame Mr. Lowe. Oh, you're a terrible person. What's wrong with you? Like, oh, you're still with these diabetic patients. We do this all the time with addictions. And it's wrong because, again, these are just organs behaving as organs will do. Treatment for adolescent um, substance use disorders have uh, historically focused on these areas individual uh, therapy, group therapy, and family behavioral health services, family therapy. And again, bear, varying degrees of success, and usually that all has to do with length of time, uh, of how long we can keep an adolescent in that process. There are a lot of evidence-based treatment programs that demonstrate efficacy, and some using medications, and we'll talk about access to teens in Truckee, specifically to medications in, in a little bit. Adolescents with substance use disorders rarely achieve long-term abstinence, so a lot of the focus is education and harm reduction. And I know that there's varying feelings or degrees of comfort with this idea of harm reduction, but at the end of the day, I cannot treat a dead patient, and it's really important. Rates of opioid use, uh, uh, misuse in adolescence, since this is kind of a big topic and has been ever since you know white suburban kids start dying. Um, and that's, I mean, completely honest there. Like, I think we all can recognize that, is that up until like the early 2000s, this has always been a problem. And then it just started to hit particular communities and everybody you know, said there's a fire. And it certainly continues to be a problem for our community. So this, this next piece, I think, in this statistic is interesting, given the makeup of our town, and I'd be really interested to see a study done on the Tahoe truck area. Because the majority of opioids, of course, are prescribed for I broke my ankle, I broke my clavicle, and I, I would guess or venture to guess that we have a lot more of these accidents happening in towns like this where our kids are involved in extreme sports and probably breaking more stuff than the average child in the average town. And so looking at how those opioids then affect us or the access in adult homes. Like, oh, I've got an old prescription that I took for my own broken, and it's just sitting in my bathroom. I don't, I've totally forgot about it, right? Um, that, is a, that, is, that is like keeping a loaded gun in my, in my bathroom when it comes to kids. Sorry, time. So going back to genetic factors, my older sister and my younger brother. Younger brother, uh, his, that dental piece will be important here, right? Uh, he, in, in high school, played for this football team. And one of the players, uh, the dad was a dentist, and the wife worked at the office. This was late 90s, early 2000s. And mom would come around after practice and say, you guys worked really hard today, good job. Here's some pain medicine. Here's some opioid pain medicine that we have. And again, remember that this was a, a really insidious time where these providers were being told this is not addictive, super safe, right? 
go ahead and give it to all your patients, no problem. So she's passing these out to be the cool mom, right? Thinking that this is probably, I'm sure in her mind, a benign thing to do, right? And maybe even the right thing to do, I don't know. I don't think I'm ever gonna have that discussion with her. Um, and, and that two out of 10 rule hit, right? Is that, that some of those kids were able to have that experience and continue to play football and continue to go to school and, oh, that's fine, that's kind of, that was nice. I got some pain relief for a little while, or maybe have an experience where I really didn't like that. That made me feel gross. My brother's experience was that for the first time in his life, he felt normal. Um, anxiety, just poof, like this magic pill. Not only took away the physical discomfort, but now I can talk to people without feeling anxious. This is great. <laughs> uh, and then, again, this is at a time that we weren't discussing the problems of opioid addiction, at least in these communities. We weren't talking about that. Um, I think he would have known, like, had you know, she been passing out bags of heroin, it would have been clear, like, oh, that's a problem, but this was a problem. And it wasn't until, gosh, probably 20 years later that we found out that my brother had silently been suffering from addiction for 20 years. Ever since that first pill was just that lit fuse, boom, done. He it was lucky enough to be able to enter treatment. I, at the time, I was working at you know, a, a very nice treatment center on the East Coast, and I had a lot of connections, so I put him in like the nicest treatment center I could find up in the Northeast, and he ended up getting a year sober, which was great. But in 2020, he died of an overdose. Because what happens and, and why time is so crucial, and why some of these other treatment supports can be so crucial to these patients and uh, to folks like my brother, is that you know he lost his tolerance to the drugs he was used to using, right? and you know just exposure to one pressed pill, and that was it. It was a pressed pill that he, I believe, thought was probably something else. Um, these pressed pill machines that they finally stopped selling on Amazon, by the way, like there's, it is really hard as a medical provider to know the difference between what is a prescribed brand or generic medication versus what was pressed inside of a college dorm room. And there was a mix of a bunch of stuff in there. It was like trazodone and gabapentin, like prescription medicines that are pretty common, but also fentanyl, and that's what and we, and we share a lot of the same genes. Like we had the same upbringing, right? Uh, you know, my parents were awesome. You know, there was no, no like major traumas in our family. It really just had to do with that fuse. And that's really important to know, right? Like it's just about lighting that fuse. When 26% of the over 13,000 addiction treatment facilities in the U.S. serve adolescents. Right? So our slim pickings, and then let's take that down even further. Only 25% of those are treated uh, opioid use disorders. <laughs> Only 15 offer, offer any kind of medication-assisted treatment in the form of an agonist, like some sort of replacement, like things like Suboxone, some people might be familiar with, which is a partial agonist. A full agonist would be like methadone. 3.6 offer inpatient, <laughs> Three, of, of, the, of that 26%, only 3.6 offer an inpatient level of care for an adolescent, and then 11 per, uh, offer residential. And again, most likely, if you're looking for those facilities, they're in the Northeast. And expensive. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the next piece. So like, I, I hate to be a downer, but the, the, the overall theme of this message, like the facility that I was running, it would cost you at least $100,000 for a year of treatment. And that was a deal, right? There are some places that will charge that for just a couple of months. <laughs> and this was a place where, you know, you had a case manager 24-7, eyes on you 24-7, every movement was tracked, you were being drug tested multiple times a week, you were receiving counseling, you were receiving family therapy, psychiatry, job training, learning how to do your laundry for the first time, learning how to cook, like, and, and then all of these fun events to keep you engaged in your treatment, right? Because that's often what it takes. And so the moral of this story is we're on our own here at Truckee. <laughs> we have to figure out how we are going to treat our teams ourselves. We're not gonna send them all to facilities in the Northeast. 
nobody has the money to do that, or if they do, it's you know there's going to be maybe a few people out there that can do that. But our kids are dying now; they're hurting now. And there's ways to create these experiences in the community. You don't have to be an expensive in the you know in the middle of nowhere treatment facility to provide some of these services that we have proven are effective to help you know kids and adults get sober. That gains of treatment for um, opioid use disorder is 16 and up. So we do this at Tom Forest, and some people don't know this. They don't know that we see teens in our MET program, and we can provide them Suboxone if they need it. Right? That we can provide them naltrexone to help decrease their binge drinking, which is like 90% effective if they're just looking to cut back. Um, now, I will say and, and make sure that you understand that naltrexone is not FDA approved for folks who are younger than 18. But many studies show that it's effective, and of course it is, right? It's just nobody's really going to go do the study because now Trexone is generic and nobody's going to make money off of it, so there's really no impetus for them to do the studies on that, which sucks, but that's our system. So going back to one of the statistics earlier, uh, the dangers of earlier exposure, like this is bonkers, right? Again, what time can do, what brain development can do, and what our goal as a community really needs to focus on. If someone is exposed to use at the age of 13, there's a 70% chance that in their lifetime they're going to meet criteria, diagnostic criteria for a substance use disorder. If we can just, it's all about delay. It's not just say no. It's just say, wait, drugs aren't going anywhere. I would argue they're probably going to get better, right? <laughs> <laughs> so just like, just how can we help you just wait? And if you're using it at the age of 13 because you're riddled with anxiety, how can we get you the help that you need, recognize who that person is, and get you the help that you need where you won't have to turn to that, again, very hard road to turn back from where you find if I just do this, I don't care if my parents are fighting in the other room. If I just do this, all of that somatic trauma that I'm not even recognizing as somatic trauma just lifts and magically goes away. Right? And that's a really... <laughs> really hard thing to deny ourselves at the age of 13 when we are capable of making rational decisions. So if we can just hold off, right? I can just, I can just uh, limit as much as I possibly can the exposure. Maybe we can stop promoting a culture where it's normal that our kids are going down to Prosser and dying, right? Maybe we can stop, because I'm hearing these stories on the back end. Their parents aren't hearing these stories. They're not coming home and saying, hey, I think I got a problem, or I think my friend was sexually assaulted last night, or I think I might have sexually assaulted somebody when I was really drunk. Like, th that's, not, that's not the story that's coming out. It's coming out of my office. Like, I'm catching it on the back end. So it's delay tactics. And, and what are successful ways to delay? So I like to think about this. When I talk to parent groups, I often talk about the normalization and promotion and acceptance of harm reduction when our kids are learning how to walk. I'm sure a lot of us have these things. If we had children, I know I have these things. That pain in the butt one on the toilet seat that's like in the middle of the night, I was always like, oh, come on, I just gotta get you open. So my kids were learning to walk, and I recognized, like, oh, some of these things, they could, they could drink Dawn dish soap, or they could eat a, a, a laundry pot, or whatever, right? So I locked up all these cabinets, because I knew that they were at risk of being harmed, right? You use that same level, and that same thought process, that same, like, core ethos of parenting, throughout all of your parenting, you just level up. Like, that's all that happens. And leveling up means that now I've taken a look at my home and I've looked for things like, do I have any air duster next to my computer? Right? Do I have that Costco size whipped cream can that always seems to be like, why is this out again? Like, why is it like it's full? I just bought this yesterday. Another defective one, I guess I gotta return to Costco. The, you know, the nitrous in there doesn't seem to be working, right? Do I have alcohol in the home? And that's a hard sell, I will say, to the trucky adults, because we have a huge adult alcohol problem that we need to address in this town. I, 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 when I first moved here, just as a you know, fun statistic, I had heard, and I believe it rings true to this day, that the Safeway in Truckee is the number one sales alcohol in all the United States. We're encouraging Safeway because of the alcohol. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Proves how much you're I think you're doing a now, you know. <laughs> right. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's massive, right? It's it's a huge. Um, and when I when I moved here uh, first before the programs that, that started running, and you, you might know this too, but I remember hearing a statistic that at any given time, seven out of ten patients on the ICU could be going uh, through alcohol withdrawal. I've heard that, like, but I don't look at that. Yeah. I have heard we have a in the past. I think we're doing that, and and why is because what happened, they weren't coming in for alcohol withdrawal. They were coming in because they had some other medical problem. And, oh, Mr. Lowe finds out that if he goes a day or two without drinking, he starts to go through DTs. He didn't know, like, and that's most adults, by the way. Most adults are what we would consider functioning addicts, right? They're doing just fine, so there's no problem. <laughs> um, they get pulled over by the guy they went to high school with, and they're like, oh, damn, John, Jonathan, man, get, get your ass home. I'm not going to cite you this time. I'll be you know, solid. I also remember hearing when I first moved to town that you weren't a true local until you got your first DUI, and that was like the joke. Right, and and that I think speaks to the culture of where we live, and, and thinking about like how do we change that culture, starting in our own home. I don't keep, you know, it's a weird introduction I will say to some high school parents that come over to meet me for the first time. But I usually introduce myself and I say we don't have any drugs or alcohol in the house, and we don't have any guns. <laughs> nice to meet you, <laughs> because I would want to know that about where my son was going to, right? Um, and, and yeah, and you kind of think about, okay, what do I need to keep an eye on in the home? What do I need to lock up now? Because it's not going to be, you know, hopefully the, the laundry pods anymore. I think that fat is gone, right? <laughs> right? It's going to be your air dusters, your inhalants, right? Look in the garage, right? Inhalants, again, are, are I, I think people are surprised at the rates at which adolescents experiment with inhalants. Um, it's a really cheap, easy, and very impactful. And, and, and thinking about our own culture and what's the shift and things that we really don't have a handle on yet, then again, uh, psychedelics, right? Um, there's a lot of adults growing mushrooms in their own house for you know, well-meaning purposes, right? But there's a lot of kids that know and have access to those grow rooms and are kind of allowed to take whatever they want from them. And that's a, that's a tough message, right? If you're, if, if you're an adolescent and uh, mom or dad comes home at the end of every day, oh man, I had a long day. Cocktail. Right? Over time, what's the message? Oh, well, you've had a bad day, have a drink. And, you know, that's how you wind down. Or celebrations. Like, we're here to celebrate. I went to, uh, I don't think I've been to a single school function yet, or no, one, and that was only because of the restriction of the site that didn't have alcohol at it, which to me, coming from the East Coast, was like, that is weird. And I don't know if anybody else knows that that's weird. That there was like a middle school poetry slam at Alibi, who's one of the biggest like distributors of funds to most of our community programs. And that's weird, right? I love Alibi. I love what they're doing. Thank you for funding things. But they were relying on breweries to do this. Uh, it's a little strange, right? When I take my kids to these functions and all the teachers have a pint of beer. Over time, we need to understand what this is doing to our kids. And so I would challenge people to think about their own home environment. And if you have a tween or teen, I would highly recommend, like, we don't need to have alcohol at every meal. We don't need to have one of the Casa Baez, uh, you know, margaritas that are supposed to cause you to black out every time we go to Taco Tuesday. Like, we can, we don't have to do this every time we go out skiing or uh, to events or concerts with our family. We can show, like, actually, I don't need this to have to wind down. I don't need this to have a good time. Like, we're going to have a good time regardless. And if that, I would challenge you, if that thought makes you feel uncomfortable, <laughs> you should really dig in there and see if there's something there that you might need some support with. Because a lot of folks, uh, I remember when my brother was in early recovery, we were hosting Thanksgiving at my house, and I said, no alcohol this year. It, his, it, he didn't have an alcohol use disorder, but it's, it's too risky. Right, it's too risky to rewrite that thing. Um, and I had family members who were like, if, I, if, if you guys don't have red wine, I'm not coming. Like close family members who did, obviously didn't understand addiction right, to, to the way that I do. And we, started, and we had to say, like, okay, well, don't come next year and we're good. Um, maybe next year. Um, hey, Jonathan, I'm going to jump in. We have about 15 minutes left. No. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> so I'm curious, and like, I don't think we need to do the breakout because I think what you're sharing is so important. But I'm curious about the conversation of the kids that we know that already have lip diffuse. Yes. Okay. Lip diffuse. 
So this is uh, something that I think thematically we can all agree that we've heard time and time again and keep on hearing. This is just a little snapshot of Truckee. What a great place to live. And what do we hear over and over again? There's nothing to do here, right? There's nothing to do here. And certainly that is true for a, a lot of kids because one is that a lot of these things take money, a tremendous amount of money, and interest. My kids aren't sporty. They're like gothy little rockers and like theater <laughs> kids. Like they're artsy kids. You know, they're not going to join the snowboarding team. They're not going to get their dopamine from that. And, and I have yet to hear somebody give me a good answer to this. What do the children in our town do after the sun goes down? Where do they go? Well, we were going to have a theater at one time. Cool. Do we have one? No. All right. We literally have nothing. Not even like a boring bowling alley that they don't want to go to in the Truckee area. Right? And, and again, a lot of these things, they take... You know, uh, physical acumen, again, that my children and I do not have, and they take money. We need to, we have money. We have people in this town that care about this town. I, every adult that I've talked to about this problem has been wanting to help. They just need to know, how can I help? And a lot of these uh, folks, I think, can help by just funding things that then can be driven by other adults that help keep our teenagers and kids on their toes in terms of events and a variety of events. It can't just be... Sports, 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 sports. So going back to what was going to be the breakout session, and I apologize we're not going to have time, we'll continue this conversation. Again, any one of these topics I could have taken like a whole lecture series on. But looking at the biolog uh, the biopsychosocial illness model, think about like, okay, so where do we fit in? Like, what can we do? We're not going to be able to do anything about this, but I would urge parents to talk to your family, starting in adolescence, based on and use their questions as a guide or how much they already know. Uh, usually by the sixth, seventh grade, they've done some sort of lesson on DNA and how that usually affects like eye color. Well, now I can talk about, and I did this with my own children, the DNA in our family and how it might affect other things, including how your brain works, including did you know that in our family we have this thing called addiction? Do you know what addiction means? Yes. What, what does it mean to you? Do you know what a, a drug is? Yes. What does the drug mean to you? And then, especially as they grow older, talking about, you, you, I, you might have this fuse. Right? And I want you to know that if it gets lit, that's all that, that is. That feeling, that experience that you have, that's your fuse getting lit. And I need you to come talk to me. And if you can't talk to me, go to Jonathan's Smart Recovery Meeting at the high school, which is 2.45 every Friday that school is open, free to all uh, public school, uh, uh, Tahoe Truckee Unified School District. Right. We had it at 2.45 because I wanted to give some time for the North Tahoe kids to get over there and at least catch a part of the group. Um, talk to your pediatrician, right? Just know that there's this fuse, right? So maybe that's what we could do with the biology piece. Either that or, you know, uh, do better screenings before we procreate. I don't know. <laughs> um, certainly my wife was surprised, like, you, you didn't tell me about that. Is that your family? I'm like, no, it's mine now. Uh, so <laughs> Uh, the psychological piece uh, for my therapist in the room and my school counselors in the room, right? This is that piece where the anxiety, the depression finds a really easy avenue to feel better and to get help because the drugs that Jonathan prescribes, like Prozac, are kind of trash and they don't really work all that well, but this works super well, right? Uh, is that how do we recognize, identify these kids and get them help as early as possible because the name of the game is delay, 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 delay. This is, I think, the, the parts where I would say we really come in as like a social piece for the general, you know, trucky area. Again, what are our kids, like, we can't expect our kids to get better if we're not giving them any avenues to get better. And ways that have proven to be more effective than others are things like um, uh, teen centers, but specifically teen centers statistically that are driven by teens with adult financial supporters. Having a teen center at the kids' zone, cool, not cool to kids. Like, no teen wants to go to the kids' zone. Like, they're awesome. But that's a problem. That can be an issue. You, you might only attract the kids that you don't really need to get in the door. You know, you need the delinquents. You need to find, how am I going to get Jonathan Lowe through that door and to not do the things he's doing afterwards, right? Or, again, like, you know, a movie night, at the, like that's not going to cut it. Like you need teen centers that are driven by teens, varieties 
of things that, that they can do and have access to, things like recording studios, music equipment, bands that come through, art, poetry slams, and like let the kids just run it and stand in the background and make sure that they don't get hurt. Right? Stand in the shadows. That's that's a more effective strategy proven in other teen centers across the nation. Gotta make it cool. Getting connected with some of our local athletes. Like we've got these like way cooler than me athletes that are covered in tattoos that are in recovery. Like that's who we need to tap into. Like, hey, would you mind coming by and talking to these kids? <laughs> Sharing your story. Like, like it's it's cool as I try and be with my little memes, like it's not gonna work. Like I'm not gonna reach people the same way that like this skateboarder that they idolize reaches them out of woodwork. Right? Utilizing some of the natural things that we have unique to our area to our advantage. The social piece again, little things that we can do just in our home, not even as a community, other than kind of monitoring and thinking about what do my kids are exposed to, have access to, Here's another strategy, and it's the, again, it's the, the nice thing is, is that all parents have done this when their kids were little. When my kid was little and would come home with, um, you know, a classmate had chicken pox. All adults, right? you know, just to let you know there's been an exposure. <laughs> like, look out for these signs and symptoms. For something that uh, is arguably much less of a problem than exposure to substances, as we learned from that 70% marker at the age of 13. So we have to get comfortable with the following, and something that I've done myself is that if I go into my son's room and find a cigarette, a joint, whatever, it is on me, because usually we don't talk about these things. We address our kids, right? we sit them down, these are the rules of the house, if there are any, these are the boundaries that I'm going to set if I hold them, right? <laughs> but I think it's important to take that same strategy we used when they were little and call their parents up, and I've done this, and said, hey, I've got to let you know, like our kids hang. And we know already that this doesn't happen in a vacuum. None of our kids are scoring alone. So this means your kid has been exposed. And this is the despair. Like, regardless how I feel about you as a parent, like, I need, if, if we need to talk to each other. Like, we need to maybe talk to each other about not letting one of us be the cool parent that thinks they're doing the right thing by letting kids safely use in their home. There's no such thing as exposing adolescents safely to drugs and alcohol. It's just, that, that's, not, that's not real. Talk to each other. Just talk to the other parents. And say, like, hey, I found this. It means highly likelihood your kid's up to this, too. And here's another one. Drug tests. Why we don't do this as a standard of practice in primary care continues to confound me to this day. Right? We, I, every year, my son has to get tested for all these things he might have. Tuberculosis, like all these things, right? <laughs> Meanwhile, it's something that, that if he had can be detected and could mean a 70% chance of him having a life-altering illness is not being monitored. Except for, are you using any drugs and alcohol? I'm asking you in front of your mom, by the way. Uh, so as parents, we might need to also drive this and ask for these services. And I know it gets tricky with autonomy, but again, we have to remember that we are not dealing with rational people, and please just, we, can't, we have to stop negotiating with terrorists. <laughs> so, um, drug tests, they're effective, especially newer drug tests, like the ones that you get in the store sometimes not so great. There's a company called Millennium where you can just spend $60 and they will test for all of these psychedelics, xylazine, uh, fentanyl analoids. How, how many of you are familiar with the drug U-47700, right? Some of your kids are aware of that. <laughs> Um, that is a, uh, this like, it usually comes in a liquid form and is uh, made and distributed legally in some European countries and can be ordered off the dark web. Um, and uh, it's like a, a fentanyl, like a really strong fentanyl, but it doesn't show up in fentanyl tests. Right? It doesn't show up in any drug screens. Um, the only way we ever caught kids using it in treatment is uh, we would look for the kid who was like going like this into the bathroom and coming out like this from the bathroom with like pain pricks. We're like, oh, all right, gotcha. Right? It doesn't matter what the drug test said, I got you. Um, search the room. So uh, codeine tests, right? A lot of this starts with vaping. Vaping is a huge issue, and that that's triggers, especially at those early ages, that process and that chance that they are going to then meet criteria for a substance use disorder in the years to come. A codeine test is very cheap. It, 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 it detects the uh, breakdown of nicotine in the system. So now you can test your kid, and, and, and here's the beauty of being a parent, right, is that your kids own nothing. 
They own nothing. My child doesn't have a phone. My child doesn't have clothes. My child doesn't have a car. He has a lot of things that I allow him to have. Right? None of these things are his yet. And there's leverage there to use when you're working with someone who isn't capable of making rational decisions. We can sit down and say, hey, these are the rules of our house. They might be different than your friend Dave's, but these are the rules of our house. And if I see these things, I want you to know that, like, for an example, right? my kids um, have access to a cell phone, but the rule is I always know your passcode, and any time I feel like it, I can ask you for your cell phone, and I can just unlock it and just take a peek around. And getting them used to that really early on so it's not weird, so suddenly when they're like 17 years old, right? Um, that I want you to know that like one of the key signs, and this is, this is really tricky for adolescents, the behaviors that usually mark the emergence of a substance use disorder are changes in mood, right? Okay, great, awesome. Change in mood in an adolescent means that they're using substance. That's every adolescent, right? Uh, but looking for things like real changes, changes in friends group, uh, in friend groups, right? They were a soccer player forever, and now they're just like, I'm not joining the team this year. I don't have any interest in that. Right? These little, the behaviors will always tell you what's going on because the kid is not going to honestly be able to tell you what's happening. That's where you want to dig. And that digging should, I would argue, include drug testing that then can come with some sort of consequence. But also the offer of help and education so it's not just you're being a bad teenager. Like, no, you're, you have organs that are responding to this. It's outside of your control. This is a medical diagnosis. We need to get you help. And again, that help is not going to come from a thousand dollar, you know, a day treatment center on the East Coast. We're going to have to try and build that as professionals and community supports in our own community. And I'm sorry, I could go on and on about this stuff forever. But go. Also, if you can share how, what ages you see, and then how were our parents to get like, to feel like they're chocolate. <laughs> so right now, <laughs> so when I first when I first started at Tala Morris Hospital, I remember interviewing them like, okay, so we're going to have you do rounds on the ED and the ICU every day and see kids and adults. Like, there's no way, like, one person is going to be able I'm going to fill with adults only in a matter of, like, seconds, which was the case. So right now, I, I can't see anybody under the age of 18 at the hospital practice. We're just hiring more staff is the answer. And so we have a new psychiatrist coming on board who's all, like, going to allow some more wiggle room to work with kids. So we're, I do a lot of consultations with primary care providers because they might not have the time to really dig into this stuff or know about the resources. And then I try and do what I can, like the smart recovery group on the outside. And again, that's every Friday, wellness center, Truckee High, 245. If school's in session, I'm there. Turns out the uh, you know, high schoolers aren't like, you know, oh, we really all want to get sober. But, uh, you know, pizza's a good driver, right? Uh, <laughs> so encourage them to just check it out. I think um, so far, everyone who's reluctantly dragged themselves or been dragged into that recovery group has left saying, like, oh, that was, that was actually it was okay. Like, I like, that was kind of cool. There's no sponsorships. There's no religious dogma attached. It's really, like, based on a lot of neuroscience and talks like this. Um, but, yeah, there's, there's slim pickings out there. So you're 18 and up. I'm 18 and up. And Emily's in your place. 18 and up. Yeah, and I'm, I'm trained and then worked with kids, whereas Emily, I think, is strictly. So, but yeah, I, I miss my kiddos, they're my favorite, especially my adolescents. Any other thoughts about like what we might do as a community, or maybe things that are already happening that I might not even be aware about, uh, you know, ways in which we are trying to counteract some of these strong forces that are pulling our kids away from us? Hey, Jonathan, um, we're almost at 10.30. I think it actually just turned 10.30. Oh. Um, and I feel like this is such a needed conversation that this almost laid the groundwork for it, but we actually need to then have the conversation about what do we do and, oh. and the students that are struggling with limited resources in our community and can't yeah. afford a back east retreat, you know, recovery yeah. center. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering if we continue this conversation and we can make this the focus of our next meeting as well. Um, I'm not sure your availability, but like as a group, I feel like there's so much conversation to have around this. Um, and this has been such helpful information for us all to really understand the science and, and how we, we've gotten to this place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no problem. I'm, I'm more than happy to do that. In fact, I love that idea because again, I, like, we could talk about any one of these mm -hmm. little topics forever. 
Uh, another area I will say is just like get out there and spread the word. So anytime I sit down and have a talk like this with a parent, they get it. They're like, oh, I didn't realize. I didn't know that one joint today equals the strength of 10 joints when I came up in the 70s. I didn't know that, right? I didn't know about the 70% chance that my child is going to have a substance use disorder if exposed to the age of 13. I always thought I was just being the cool dad by smoking a joint with my son. We were connecting, right? Most people when they're educated are reasonable. And, and can make better decisions, but we have to educate. I think we need panels of professionals out there educating our parents um, as best as we can. That's 70% of that includes alcohol? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, again, when, when we talk about like the, the exposure drug, the gateway drug, when we look at a functional MRI, it's interesting because that, that BTA pathway, like if I, if I have an eating disorder, which we also, by the way, uh, probably no surprise, have much higher uh, rates per capita here in towns like Truckee than we do uh, in just general pop uh, in the United States. Eating disorders, chronic self-harm, chronic thoughts of suicide, substance use disorders of any type will all, like you really won't be able to tell the difference on what's happening. Like you won't be able to pick out this brain versus that brain. It's that same neural pathway, that addictive dopamine uh, kind of informed pathway. It really doesn't matter. There are some drugs I will say, I know we're out of time, that it does you know, like cocaine, for example, or methamphetamine. If I start using today, I'm at high risk of addiction, <laughs> regardless if I've used it at the age of 13. They're, uh, going back to that slide of dopamine release and seeing the amphetamines at the thousand mark, right? there are certain, or even prolonged use. Like if I drink every single day, I'm, I'm going, regardless of my fuse, going to develop a physical dependency to that substance. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan. Yeah. I really appreciate you. Um, there were a few comments online um, that saying the presentation was amazing. Let's keep this conversation going. Um, this yes. is incredible. Thank you. Um, and then just some validation that we do need more resources for non-athletic um, kids in our, our oh. community. And seconding what you said about just having places for them to go, bowling alley. Um, yeah. So, Thank you all online and in person. I'm going to stop the recording, but we will continue this conversation at our next meeting. Um, and I hope you stay safe out there. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. Where is the knowledge? That and the, uh, I can always <laughs> drop the hat under the team song, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. I have a lot of trivial knowledge. <laughs> yeah. Just like, just swimming up there. Like, not a lot of help. <laughs> Like, what's your son's social security number? I don't know. <laughs> can you name all the new kids, new kids on the block members? Yeah, I can do that. It's really good.